And so first of all, congratulations. You guys have made it through a very, very tough class, and I hope that you are proud of yourselves. Um, this is a lot to do in eight weeks, and you have done a lot to get here. So a little applause from me. So what are we talking about this week? We are talking about object-oriented programming. Now, some languages like Java, you are always doing object-oriented programming. They've only recently added the ability to, do, ability to do what we have been doing in Python, which is functional programming. But Python, you can do either, which is one of the things that makes it a very handy language because you can write small, quick scripts, you could write large, complex programs, and you can pick and choose from a bunch of different methodologies that you want to use for your design of the programs. So what we're getting here today when we talk about object-oriented programming is the ability to take everything we've done and put it into something and name it. We can put functions into this thing we can name. We can put variables into this thing we can name. And then we can use that thing over and over and over again. So let's get into it. We got some new keywords. The first keyword is class. Now a class defines what an object will be. A class is a blueprint, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We also have the concept of a constructor. The constructor is underscore, underscore, knit, underscore, underscore, open parenthesis, self, close parenthesis. All constructors for all classes are at least that definition. You can change it, but you can only add to it. And a constructor is the starting place for your object creation. A class is a definition. An object is actually taking a chunk out of memory and doing something with it. Self is used in the class to denote the object that you're using. And that's sometimes hard for students to think about in the beginning because right now we have a variable or a list. Now we're going to have objects, and those objects are going to be of, of, of type that we create because a class is really a type. So we have the an int type and a float type and a Boolean type, and now we're going to have a class. And that class is going to be its own type, and that own type is going to have properties and functions and things that you can do. An object is an instantiation of a class, and that's where you're actually carving out the memory and putting something into it. So, some concepts of object-oriented programming. Data abstraction. When we're abstracting, when we're doing data abstraction, we're hiding the implementation of our code in the class. So, the class will have variables, and it will have functions, and you'll basically create an object, and you will be assured that when you call a function on an object or get a variable from an object, it's going to do and be what you expect. Encapsulation means that we're keeping all the states and all the variables in as much private as we can. We're only exposing what we need to for the class to be usable, for something outside of the class to use what's inside of the class. The class can be seen of as a box. And that box is solid until you punch a little hole in it and then your Python program is allowed in and some data is allowed out. It's a concept of black box programming. It is similar to a function, but it expands on it. Um, inheritance. You can create a hierarchy of class definitions. So if you have class called a vehicle, and that vehicle has wheels and propulsion. And then you have a bicycle, which is a type of vehicle, and that has two wheels and human propulsion. And then you have a car, which is another type of vehicle, that has four wheels and a motor for propulsion. So 
that's the concept of a hierarchy. And then with a car, you can get all kinds of other cars. Now, why is inheritance important? It's important because anything you define in that vehicle and that parent, you get in the child. So it's a way of more reusability. And then polymorphism is you can access an object that are different types but similar through the same interface. Now, we're not going to go into all of these right now. I just wanted to introduce you to the terminology for object-oriented programming. So when you move on, if you choose to move on and do programming, you have an idea. You've heard them before. So why do I like object-oriented programming? Reusability. My favorite subject in programming is reusability, and object-oriented programming is the next level in reusability. In fact, if you understand the, um, the constructs of your language from an object-oriented programming perspective, you can actually do some pretty neat stuff with very little code. And that's important. Um, we're naming groups of related variables and functions that we can use again and again and again. Reusability. So let's talk a little bit more about this thing called a class. Um, a class is a named collection of variables and functions. That's what it is. Um, a class has to have a unique name inside your program. And it, um, it uses variables just like you would normally have a variable. And just like you would normally have functions, you have functions. However, there is a local scope to the class. And so you have to be able to access that local scope in the class, just like when you have a local scope in a function or a local scope in a loop. But how do you get at stuff in that local scope? Well, you get at it using that self that we're going to talk about. The class is only a definition. It does not actually carve out any place in the running memory of your program. The only way you can use that to carve out memory and actually create variables with values and use those functions is by instantiating it. And we're going to talk about that next. But from the concept of a blueprint, a class is, is, is a blueprint. You can think of it as a house. You can't live in that beautiful drawing that's supposed to be your brand new house. You have to wait until the house is built. And you can build multiple houses from that same blueprint. But the blueprint isn't the house. It's just the design for the house. So um, an object is what we call an instantiation of a class. All that means is that when I create an object, I'm actually carving out that memory space in Python, and I am going to be able to assign variables and use the functions inside of it. Um, it becomes available in the running script. Just like when we had functions and we first looked at them, and, and you define a function up at the top, but the first place the um, the first place in the debugger that your program stop is way after that function's been defined. Same thing with a class. We're going to define a class, and Python's just going to kind of let it be. It's not going to do anything until we actually instantiate an object. Um, there is the access point to variables that are defined in the class, and you can have as many objects created from a single class as you want or need. Um, oftentimes, we have structures in things like databases. And what we want to do is we want to keep collections of objects that um, we've gotten from the database so they can be used in a program. And so you can have thousands of them. The mechanics of a class. So now we're going to learn how to define the class. I have a class called time. And what I have is I have the word class. That's my new keyword. And it tells Python, P 
Python, I'm about to define a type. And the thing that comes right after the word class is the name of your new type. That is the class name. Class names can be pretty much whatever you want, but they follow the same naming principles as a variable. And then you have to do a colon, just like with functions, just like with loops, just like with ifs. You have to do a function to tell Python, okay, I have, I am now going to, you're now going to go into my local scope and define things in my local scope. So then here I have inside the local scope of my class, I have the constructor. Got to have a constructor. Def is there first because a constructor is a function. Then I have the special underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, and open parentheses, self, close parentheses. Remember a few minutes ago when I said there has to be a way to get at stuff inside the class? Well, that's what that self is actually going to provide you. It's going to tell Python whether or not you're getting something from an object level or the class level. And here I just have self.hour equals zero and self.minute. That self.hour, it says, Python, this is in the local scope of the class. If it's got self dot in front of it, it is guaranteed to be in the local scope of that class. If it doesn't, then it is not necessarily in the local scope of the class. It might, actually in the local scope of the object, it might be what they call static or in the class. But we're not going to really deal with that right now. Mostly what you need to do is understand that if you're dealing with it in a variable inside of a class, you need to have self dot in front of it. And by the way, object-oriented programming is all about that dot notation. The constructor is still a function, so don't forget the colon. Then I have two variables, and that's how these variables are defined. Self.hour says this is an instance variable, so it exists inside an object. Why is that important? That's important so that I can have that each and every object I create has a different hour. They have the ability to assign a different time to each object or an hour to each object. Same with minute. So by saying self.hour equals zero and then self.minute equals zero, I have created two instance variables that I can set on my objects. Now again, this is just this is just words to Python until I create an object. So I have a class called time. My class has two variables, hour and minute. And that's what that little box is going to represent on the right hand side of the screen. It's going to represent what's in your class. So we just figured out how to define the blueprint. How in the world do we create something from it? I have my class here. Just going to go real quick. I have my time class. Now I am going to create an object from time. And I'm going to take a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The variable is named start time. On the right-hand side of the equal sign is going to be the type that I just created going to be the word time, capital T, because that's how I named the class, open and close parentheses. What Python does is it says, okay, this, somebody's think, somebody thinks this is a type. I got to go out and find that type. Do I have a class definition with the name time? The answer is yes. Python goes out and says, okay, I'm going to carve out a place in the running memory for my time class, I'm going to call the out, I'm going to put that information in a place that's associated with the start time variable, and um, I got ahead of myself. Hour equal 11 and minute equal 10 is about to come. So start time now has access to self. So I can say start time.hour equal 11. 
And that, what Python will do is it will take the hour that has been, that memory space that has been carved out, and it will set 11 equal to the, in, into that value space. The same with minute. So what you'll notice here is I did a dot notation. Mostly we've used the dot notation on functions, but now I can use the dot notation on variables. I have start time, which is my object, because I created that object of type time, dot. So it's the dot notation, which says Python. I've got an object in start time, and I want the hour variable for that object to be set equal to 11. The next line does the same thing. It says, hey, Python, for the start time object that I just created, I want you to set the variable minute that is inside that object to 10. So that is what it does. That is how you use that dot notation. And then initially, it can be a little confusing for students. But if you think of the fact that start time is equivalent to self, it helps make it a little easier. OK, it's great that I could create one object, but I can create a lot more. So here I have my class time. And I'm going to have start time equal time. And I'm going to set hour equal 11 and minute equal 11. So now I have a start time object, just like I had before. And now, so here are my little arrows going. So I have, and now I have a stop time, because maybe I'm in a race. So I've got a stop time object that was created. And you'll notice that the dot notation is the same. But I now have two places in memory carved out. I have one for start time and one for stop time. And the hour and minute in start time are different amounts than the hour and minute in stop time. And I get to those variables by using the dot notation. I'm able to set the hour in stop time by using stop underscore time dot hour equal. It's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Even though it's using a dot notation, it is still a variable. So again, I've got my object of type time, and I've got my two variables. So let me see what the constructor has in it. I want to make sure I cover the right thing. Time. Uh, OK. Um, simple time. Uh, OK, we'll keep going for just a minute, and then we'll go on through the time. I do have some more complex stuff here, and I even show you how to use it as a module. But let's keep going for the moment. OK, so constructors. So. I just showed you how to use the constructor, and I showed you how to create one. And the reason I can use hour and minute is because in the constructor, I said Python. It's self.hour and self.minute. Um, they are the first function called automatically by Python when you create that object. When that object name is on the right-hand side of a single equal sign, parentheses after it, it creates, um, it calls the init function. That's how it does it. The nice thing about a constructor is you can add arguments to it. So a constructor without arguments is class time, definite self, self hour equals zero, self hour equals hour, self minute equal minute. I can pass initializing variables into my object. So I don't have to necessarily have that equal sign all afterwards. The difference is, on the left-hand side, I do start time equal open close parentheses. Then I have to set hour and minute separately. On the right-hand side, I'm doing the same thing in a single line of code. Now, just like calling any other function, 
these values are positional. But it can get a little confusing because when you look at the constructor with arguments, you see three arguments, self, hour, and minute. But when I'm passing those arguments, I only pass two arguments. And that is because the self is silent. It's like a silent S in English that kind of drives you crazy. Well, that's what self is. It's silent. Python says self is always there. So I'm only going to look at the arguments to the right of self when it comes to variables that have passed because self is really going to be start time. So I now have my new class with my constructor and I'm going to create an instance method because every time I look at the time, I want to have it printed out the exact same way. So I have created a second function in my time class. That function is called print underscore time and it takes and it takes one argument self which means I can use the dot notation. If you see self in an argument sorry in the in the parameter list and it, by the way it has to be the first parameter. I don't think I've said that before. Self is always the first parameter. Um, if you see self in the parameter list, then it is an instance method, and you can use it with the dot notation. So in this case, I've defined print time. And print time is going to print time in a specific format. And that format has self.hour, comma, self.minute, Oh, and I missed a parenthesis. My apologies. Um, let me go catch that while I'm thinking about it. There we go. I don't know how, for how long I've missed it. Um, okay. We'll just do the rest of this. Okay. Uh, you, it, you, it's used to reference the object in the function. So to be able to use self.hour in print time, I have to have self as the first parameter in the list. Otherwise, it won't work. Okay, so how do I call an instance method? Well, I have my class time here and I have my uh, two, two functions, the constructor and the print time. First, I'm going to create my first object, which is start time with 1111, and I'm going to create my second object with stop time, which is 2 and 3. So I'm going to say start time dot print time, and it's going to print hour and minute, and it's going to come out like that. Then I'm going to print stop time dot print time. And it's going to use the variables, the value for hour from stop time and the value for minute for stop time. And it's going to print out that way. So what you what you see here is I'm using the dot notation again. I am telling Python what values to get by what variable I'm using before I call print time. Start time dot print time will always get the instance variables from the start time object. Stop time dot print time will always get the variables from the stop time object. And you will notice when I call the print time function, I have nothing inside the parentheses. And that's because I don't need it if the only parameter for print time is self. Because that self is really taking the place of the memory space in Python for that individual object. Uh, special methods. And we're gonna, I promise we're going to look at code in a minute. Okay, 
Python is one of the few programming languages that allows you to create your own operators for a class. So it's called overloading, and you can overload equal. You can overload not equal to. You can overload less than. You can overload greater than. You can overload stir. So basically what it is, is you can write comparators for your program so you can compare two objects. Two time objects can be compared one to the other. And it is uh, handled inside the object and, and it acts just like equal equal. In fact, you can use the double equal sign if you want to see if two things are equal. You do that through specially notated functions. And just like init, these functions start off with underscore underscore and then whatever you want, in this case, EQ, if you're doing the double equal sign, underscore, underscore, you open parentheses, self is the first parameter, comma, other, just whatever that other object is, close parameter. Self is the object, and other is an argument which contains a different object, but of the same type. So you have to be comparing same types. So, in this case, I'm going to overload equal, equal, and stir. So here's my class. I am now going to overload stir. I have underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore, self. So instead of defining print time, I'm defining stir. So, and then I'm going to define EQ, and that's an underscore, underscore, EQ, underscore, underscore. And the definition for that is going to be if self.hour is not equal other.hour or self.minute is not equal other.minute, then I'm going to return false because remember, double equal has two, oper two possible answers, true or false. So I'm only going to ever return true or false from this. And if I return false, then it's because they don't equal. They're not, they don't have the same values. If I return true, it's because they do. So how do I use the overloaded stir? So here's my function again. Here's my class again. And I've got my two objects, my start time object, my stop time object. And now I want to see, now I want to print them. So if I say print start time, you'll notice I didn't use the dot notation here. That's because I didn't have to. Under the hood, when I said print start time, Python said start time is of type time. Hey, does time have a stir overloaded function? And so Python says, oh yeah, this programmer put overloaded the stir so I can convert to a string for this particular class. So I'm just going to print out what it says here, and that's what you'll get. So that's how you overload stir, and I can do the same thing for stop time. Exact same thing. It's now just going to take the variables out of the start time object. Sorry, the stop time. Those are wrong, and it's going to be 2, 3. Sorry, those came from the wrong place. So, now I'm going to overload equal, equal. I have my start time object again and my stop time object again. And I'm going to say if start time is equivalent to stop time, I'm going to print tie. So, I'm going to say... I don't know why my, my animations is not right. It's going to say if self.hour is not the same as other.hour or self.minute is not the same as other.minute, it's going to return false. So, um, and you can make your own module. I can put all of this in something called time.py and then I can just import my own time.py and have my 
my time.py wherever I want it. So let's go and look at some code. And then we'll go over the labs. So here is my simple time, the one we just saw. Let's make this bigger. And yeah, these are longer. So here I have my constructor, my overloaded stir, I have an overloaded equal, I have an overloaded less than, and then I'm just going to create some and then check some. I'm going to determine what the earliest time is for t in time. So I'm. So what am I doing here? I'm saying I'm going to have three different times. I'm going to create a list of those three objects. And here's where I'm creating the list from user input. And then I'm just going to have a minimum time. And what I'm here is I'm looking for the smallest time, the lowest time. So, and I'm going to use my overloaded less than. So let's go and take a little stroll through this code. So I'm going to debug because we know I like the debugger. Now, the first place the debugger stopped is line 22, but I have all of this code above it, and that's because just like functions, Python um, just kind of catalogs this as text until we tell it to, do, to go and look at it. So Python says, okay, I have this class called time. If somebody tries to use time, I'll come figure out what's in this class. So I'm just saying I'm going to create three times I'm creating an empty list just so that I have some place to put my objects. So I'm going to say for range in num times, and I'm going to say enter hours minutes. So I'm going to say 10, 10, and then I'm going to do it again. And so, sorry, I haven't done it again. Now, I've just said I'm creating a time object. I'm going to set hours equal to 10, minutes equal to 10. And when I'm done, I have added a time object to append. To, Sorry, I've appended a time object to my times list. So if I go into my variables, I look at variables, I've got times, and I've got a time object, and I know it's a time object because Python's telling me it's type right there. And I have the hours of 10 and minutes of 10. So now I'm going to go do this again, and I'm going to go back to console, and I'm going to say 4 and 11. And so I now have 4 and 11. I'm going to split into tokens. I'm going to now create a time object with those two tokens. And I'm going to append it to my time list. So I automatically go into the constructor the minute I call time. I have hours. I have minutes. And I, if I go look at my variables, I now have two different time objects. So now let's do the third one. So this third one is just going to be 12, 59, and sorry, let the enter key. So now I have my three objects. So I am now done with my loop. Um, I can go here to my variables, and I, in fact, have three time objects. Now, it's very interesting to note here, what you see when you look at this list is not what we see down here by those these three little arrows. It is time object. And if you just printed out a time and you didn't have overloaded stir, you would get underscore underscore main dot time object with that hexadecimal after it. And they would be unique hexadecimals for each object. So 
So if you're trying to figure out why, why something like that is printing out, it's because Python doesn't have a way to convert it to a string. So now I'm just going to have a place to start, and my place to start is my minimum time. It's just time of zero. So I'm going to go through my times list, and I'm going to use the less than. Now, what's on the left is a time object, and what's on the right is a time object. And so this is where that overloading comes in. If I step into it, I end up in my class, and I am in the instance method that overloads the less than operator. And I have self. Self is what is on the left-hand side of that, left, of that less than operator. And other is what is on the right-hand side. So if I look at this, whatever T is, is self, and whatever min time is, is other. So in this case, self and other are the same, because I didn't start out at 2, I started out at 0 in my loop. So I'm going to compare the, um, I'm going to compare the object to itself. So I'm going to return false because hours is not less than hours, and minutes is not less than minutes. So now I'm going to go, and my t is now for 11, but my min time is still 10, 10. So I'm going to go back into my less than, and lo and behold, 4 is less than 10, so I'm going to return true. I've got one more to check. So now I have 12.59, and I'm going to go back in. T is my min time. Sorry, T is 12.59. My min time is 4.11 because I changed it on the last one. I'm going to go back into my less than. 12 is not less than 4. And so I'm going to return false. So my min time is 4.11. And it printed out earliest time is 4.11. Now, and I should have done that, I apologize. When I did this, you'll notice I didn't put a stir here. And I didn't put a stir there because I have this stir here. Python said, oh, wait a minute, this is a type time. So I would normally just give you an error because I don't know how to turn it to a string, but because you overloaded the stir method, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to print it out in this format and send it back as a string. So we can even do something called a stopwatch. So um, if you want to go through this, we can. If not, Basically, this is just a large function that I wrote where you, it populates um, some competitors and it says who's, you know, the fast, who started out the fastest, who's in the middle, and who won the race. Um, and and it's between the tortoise and the hare. So this is just a bigger example, but. Also what it does is it imports time. Here's time.py. This time.py is a little bit more complex than the previous time that we just looked at. But basically, it's a class called time, and it has hours, minutes, and seconds because it's a race. And it's not an Olympic race, so you're not split in seconds, but we have the stir. We have an overloaded less than, an overloaded greater than, an overloaded equal. We can even diff them and get the difference. Now, you'll notice that there's nothing outside the class definition, and that's okay. That's because I named my time class in a time.py file. Sorry about that. And so I can use it 
in my stopwatch class by simply importing it from time, okay, time.py, import the time class. That's how that's read. And then what we have is we now use that time as part of a larger program, just like when you imported OS. So this is, and you, we can go over this if you want. I think it's probably better to spend a little time on the labs. Um, so let's do that. Let's go spend a little time on the labs so we can answer people's questions. Okie dokie. Okay. And this is just what I just said about using it as a module. You can use the from keyword and the module name, and you can then tell Python to read in this information. And in this case, it's the, it's the class time. And then you can simply use it like you would any other time object. Okay, so it, this is 8.9, and we're going to define a class called car. We're going to have a constructor. Each car is going to have a model, a purchase price, and a current value. We're going to define a function to calculate the current value, and it's going to take as parameters the current year, and it's going to set the depreciation rate to 0.15. It's going to get the age, set the age of the car. It's going to calculate the current value of the car, and then it's going to set the current value of the car. So then we have a print function, so it can print things out. You can also do this as a stir overload. We're going to define a main function. We're going to input the year, the price, and the current year. And we're going to create a car object. We're going to set the model year. We're going to set the purchase price. We're going to calculate the current value. And we're going to call the function to print the car information. So this is very much like what we did with our time object. Very much like that. You just have to remember where to put the self and where to use the dot notation. So this one, we're going to have a team. We're going to have a team object. We're going to create a, a constructor. Every team has a name, a number of wins, and a number of losses. And we're going to initialize the number of wins and the number of losses to zero. And then we're going to say get win percentage. We're going to calculate the percentage of wins based on the number of wins and the number of losses. I'm going to create a main function. I'm going to create a team object. I'm going to put the I'm going to get as input the name of the team, the wins and the losses. I'm going to set the team name, set the number of team wins, set the number of team losses. Then I'm going to calculate the win percentage, and I'm going to say if it's greater than 0.5, output congratulations. Otherwise, you're outputting team has a lot, has a losing average. So these are very much like what we did for the time, um, the time class. So questions. And go ahead and open up the mics if you just want to talk. Hey, I actually, I was the one to ask the question earlier about the um, deaf print. I'm sorry. I'm on three point. My, I need to shut my dog out. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a beagle, but she's quiet right now. Come on. I'm sorry. When I talk, he thinks I'm talking to him. Um <laughs> I used your like pseudocode here to write it in the first place, and I tried using the string method, and it didn't work, and I did it the other way with the self function, mm -hmm. and I got like six out of the ten points. Okay. And I got an error on line 30 saying that I was missing the three required positional arguments. So when okay. I do it one way, it gives me no points and when I do it the other way it gives me partial points that still won't print so I don't know what I'm doing you 
you copy and paste your code into the chat? Okay. I am not computer savvy at all. I'm an environmental science major, so. That's okay. <laughs> you made it this far, Kelly. I hope you're proud of yourself. I, yeah, I know how to do nothing, so this has been a feat all on its own. All right. Let me, you said just copy and paste? Just copy and paste it into the chat. That's easiest. Okay. I'm sorry. Bear with me. You're fine. Here we go. All right. Jeff Prince. it out. That looks funny, but... Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, print info. Value. Okay. So, self, model year, purchase price, current value. Can you show me where this is called? Can you paste the code in where this is actually called? A line of code? Uh, what line is that on, you mean? Wherever you're Wherever you're calling print info. Line 30 is calling print info. And that is actually put in by the computer. That's not me. I can't mess with that. Okay. So can you just copy and paste it in anyway? Yeah. I'm doing that now. I'm okay. just letting you know that I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to do anything with that. All right. Okay. Okay, that's because what you've got here, okay, is you've got model year, purchase price, and current value. The reason it's giving you that error, and the reason I don't like the way they have defined that, is that um, the print info should not need to have any argument. So if I have self as the only argument, so if you get rid of model year, purchase price, and current value, you can ex you can get to model year, purchase price, and current value because you have the self. This is I the took it out. Value. So I took those three out, and it took all my points away. <laughs> okay. That's where I got really confused, and I tried to use your string method as well, and I didn't get any points for that. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what I think I should be doing is taking the points away, and this here is the only thing that's giving me any, and I don't know okay. what to do at this point. This is redundant. You yeah. don't need that. Okay? Yeah. I kind of and thought that, it was true. Yeah, and that's why you're getting the error when you're calling this. Okay. So the question then is, are these properly indented in your code? Um, are those indented one to the right? Yes. All okay. The, yeah, they are. All the things that are in orange are, are indented one to the right? Yeah. So when you're saying it doesn't give you any point, what is the difference that it shows between what you have and what it's expecting? Um, whenever I submit it. Can you take a screen capture real quick? I'm not sure. I'm not big. I've never used Zoom really much other than watching, so I'm not sure how. Okay. This is me, I can. But all you have to do is use, like, control print screen, save it to a file, and copy the file in. But if that's not something that's easy for you to do, what I wanted to know is, I want to know because when you call this without those three arguments, um, my first two inputs are saying that my program produced no input, but the third and fourth tests are coming back correctly. 
And okay. Print and sew method exists, so it gives me two points for that. Uh -huh. Any time I change that or take anything out, it takes those away. Okay. So what I'd like to see, though, is I'd like to see the comparison because Zybook should be doing a comparison between okay. what it's expecting and what you have. Oh, and this my just says no in, no output. No my output. Program produced no output. Yeah. Okay. So which makes me um, it's suspicious to me because you're calling it correctly. There should not be any. The mo model year purchase price and current value should go away. Um, that's why it makes me think that it's not formatted properly because your code looks correct. But you, when you copied this in, it seemed to not have the proper formatting, so that's where that question came from. Yeah. I, this is hard since I can't show you. So I deleted those three things out. I just commented them out, and I'm okay. back to getting zero points. I, okay. I produced no output at all. Okay. And so the only, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. No, the only thing I can do is, um, yeah, because I need I need to actually see what your code looks like, and what Zybooks looks like. So I would almost need to see a screen capture of your code from Zybooks. Okay. You're not in my cat class, are you, Kelly? I'm not. I'm sorry. I wish I was. That would make it easier. Sorry. No, so that would make it easier. I'm not. Um, um, I can't get to your Zybooks to actually go out and look at your code and comment on it. Okay. I can only get to the people that are in my class. Alrighty. I can try emailing my teacher and seeing if she can help me with anything. I thought maybe I was just doing something silly or ridiculous and you would know. And uh, I the call looks correct. The only thing that looked incorrect was no. this. But I don't know why you're not seeing output. And that's why this concerns me a bit, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. Yeah. I just, it, it may have just, the chat may have taken out the formatting. Alrighty. The only thing I could do is say, get a, you know, do a print screen and send me the print screen, or show the print screen here. I was trying to look at this to see if I could share my screen, but it doesn't look like I can. No, I don't think people can share their screen. This isn't Zoom. This is um, pre-conference call because the school doesn't have a Zoom account, a full Zoom account. Yeah. Uh, they use like Adobe something or other, and it drives me crazy. So I pay for this. It's just a lot less expensive than Zoom, but it doesn't have some of the um, the features that Zoom would have. Alrighty. Hey, thanks for your help, though. I appreciate it. No problem. Good luck, Kelly. Thanks. Um, no problem. Anybody have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, you're welcome, Joey. Um, I'm glad that all of this has helped you. That is why I do these. So you guys have a great weekend, a spectacular finish to the class. And um, whether or not you follow on in a programming career or not, I hope that you've enjoyed what you learned. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to stop the recording, and I should have this up tomorrow.